very interesting conference, and um, I'm glad to be back again. So today, uh, I want to talk about joint work with Mark Kohler uh, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And the background for what I'm going to tell you about was described by Steve Boyer uh, earlier in this conference. And those of you who are last week heard talks by Josh Green sort of related to the conjecture that motivates this. But still, just to uh, recap, let me give the basic definition that I want to talk about. And um, I will uh, remind you what the conjecture says. So a group, you should always think accountable group G, uh, is left orderable. if it has a total order which is invariant under left multiplication. So where, if I have two elements, A and B, where A is less than B, this implies that C times A is less than C times B for all A, B, and C in the group. Um, and by convention, I want the trivial group not to be left orderable. So let me, let me exclude that. Um, so examples, I'm sure you've seen, but allow me to remind you, something like the integers under addition with the usual order on the integers is an example, um, something like a free group. It's less obvious, but true. Um, another example would be the kind of thing I'm going to be interested in today is three manifolds. So for example, the fundamental group of a prime three manifold with positive first Betty number uh, will always have orderable fundamental group. Um, and some non-examples, I want to think in some sense of a group being left orderable, it's sort of a, a big group. Uh, any group with torsion, torsion elements uh, cause problems here. Or another example of a, again, a three manifold example, let's say the fundamental group of the Weeks manifold, smallest volume closed hyperbolic manifold. So the, it's the definition of um, an orderable group, and what I'm going to be interested in today is when is the fundamental group of a three-manifold uh, left orderable? So let me just, so I don't have to keep saying fundamental group of, let me just define three-manifold Y, I'll call it orderable, when its fundamental group uh, is left orderable. So the conjecture that motivates what I'm going to tell you today um, is suppose we have um, a rational homology three sphere Some, and um, let me make, let me assume it's uh, irreducible. Then the conjecture posits that the following three things are equivalent. Uh, the first is that the fundamental group of Y is left orderable. Um, the second is that the manifold has some non-trivial, let's say, Hagar floor homology. Um, so it's what's called Y is not an L space. Um, and then three, uh, that the fundamental, that, sorry, that the manifold Y has a co-orientable taut foliation. So 
um, the conjecture is that these things are equivalent. The only implication that we currently know amongst them is that uh, having a taut foliation implies that you're not in L space. So these three things, I'm not going to tell you about these. I think you already heard something about that. But um, a priori, these things think, don't look like they're connected. Um, this conjecture is uh, surprising to me. And, and to be honest with you, I don't believe it. Uh, but despite that, to show how wrong I am, uh, a lot of evidence has accumulated over the past decade for this conjecture. So uh, maybe just to mention two things, combining work of Boyer and Clay with work of Hanselman, Rasmussen, Rasmussen, and Watson, this conjecture is true for all graph manifolds. So anything that's built up solely of cipher fiber pieces, um, another piece of evidence. I've done some experimental studies of this question. So it's true for at least 100,000 uh, hyperbolic, closed hyperbolic three manifolds in some, some census or another. So in fact, although I, my work here was motivated by a desire to disprove this conjecture, what I'm going to tell you about today is further evidence for this conjecture. In particular, I'm going to tell you about ways to produce um, a lot of orders. I'm going to give you, uh, describe a tool for producing, producing orders on three manifold groups um, and then use that to prove some, some theorems which provide uh, evidence for this conjecture. Are there questions so far? So the setting for today um, is we're going to have, a, let's say we have a rational homology three sphere. And um, we have some knot. And I'm going to be interested in the exterior of this. So we'll take M to be y minus an open regular neighborhood of k. Um, and uh, always going to assume that m here is irreducible. And what I'm going to be interested in is Dane filling. On this manifold m, right, the manifold m has boundary, which is a torus. So you can take a solid torus and glue that solid torus to M along their boundary. There's different ways you can do that. And um, what I'd like to explore is which Dane fillings on M uh, are orderable. If you believe this conjecture, as Steve, I'm sure, talked about earlier, this tells you certain things about how you expect what kind of Explain in a minute how you parameterize the Dane fillings, but sort of orderable fillings should come in kind of families and they should behave in certain ways. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do today is give two theorems which are compatible with that, um, those predictions. Um, and I'm going to introduce, so I'm going to state the two theorems. And then um, I'm going to spend the rest of the time describing the technique behind them. Uh, which is hardly new. Uh, the technique I'll use for producing these left orders is something that's been used for going back to work of, of um, Eisenbud, Hirsch, and, and Neumann, cipher fiber case, that's almost 40 years. Um, but the new contribution will be um, sort of organizing this, this technique into a picture uh, which we can argue about. So um, after Giving the theorems, I'll explain how the theorems are derived from pictures, from pictures such as these. Okay, so uh, the first theorem I want to talk about is 
said this all joint work with Mark Kohler. This theorem was also discovered independently by Steve Boyer. Um, so there'll be some technical hypotheses that I'll have to define. But first, let me just write down the statement. So throughout my talk, I'm going to have this set up. So I have some uh, not exterior in a, um, oh, sorry, I said rational homology sphere. Let's, I can work with that, but let's just for simplicity, let me say an integral homology three-sphere. So you can think about it as, as just the ordinary three-sphere, but um, it is more general than that. Um, so if the Alexander polynomial of the manifold has a simple root on the unit circle, Um, and an additional technical hypothesis I'll explain in a minute called being lean. Uh, then a lot of Dane fillings on this manifold um, are orderable. Uh, so then there exists some epsilon greater than zero such that um, if we look at a Dane filled manifold, so I have to describe my notation for parameterizing these Dane fillings. Sorry, get to that in just a second. But uh, the Dane fillings will be parameterized by a, a rational number um, so that this Dane filling is orderable. Uh, for all choices of R uh, in, let's say, the interval from minus epsilon to epsilon. So R is going to be a rational number. So it's saying that if you're in this interval, then your Dane filling is always, always order. Um, and that, all right, so that's the statement. Um, and then if you combine this theorem with results of Rachel Roberts, then um, you learn that, in fact, uh, the conjecture here is uh, holds for these manifolds. I'll just put it here. Uh, moreover, so specifically, Roberts constructs uh, taut foliations um, on all Dane fillings. Um, in this interval, and so um, you're in the situation where you do have a top foliation, hence by this theorem you're not in L space, and what we're proving is that the manifold is ordered. Um, uh, well, I mean, yes, in theory. Uh, but actually, I mean, in Robert's results, you can actually take epsilon to be one, so, I don't know. Epsilon's less than one, so. Uh, other questions? Okay, so, so I need to tell you what lean is and, and also fix my notation for um, Dane filling. Right, so here uh, I've done the usual thing. We fix the basis, call it mu and lambda, for the homology of the boundary of M. Um, where here, chalk is not going to survive. I hope no one after me is giving a chalk talk. There's only this whole box here. Um, so uh, where here, uh, mu is a meridian for the not k, uh, and lambda is the homological longitude. So in other words, lambda becomes zero in the homology of M itself. The usual, just as an S3 meridian longitude framing. Um, and then if we take a rational number, A over B, 
uh, the Dane filling M of A of B. This is M union a solid torus attached so that um, the curve A mu plus B lambda, that curve on the boundary torus, uh, bounds the meridian disk. So that specifies the Dane filling um, completely. Um, and then I guess the remaining thing I have to tell you about is this definition of lean. This is somewhat technical, and you can replace it with an even more technical hypothesis, which is weaker. Anyway, um, M is lean means that if you look at the zero Dane filling on M. So this is the only Dane filling which has positive Betty number. Um, means that this guy is prime uh, and um, the only incompressible surfaces in this thing are fibers and vibrations over the circle. The only incompressible, if you prefer the term essential, In this closed manifold, uh, is a fiber. Over the circle. So uh, this manifold, again, the first Betty number is positive, so it does contain an incompressible surface. Um, there aren't very many. Right, so I think that's now a complete statement of the theorem. Questions? Oh, so maybe before going on to the second result, I should talk about um, how restrictive these hypotheses are. Um, it turns out that having a simple root on the unit circle is very common. So for example, if you look at the 1.6 million knots with less than 16 crossings, um, some 80% of them have simple roots on the unit circle, have Alexander polynomials with simple roots on the unit circle. Um, and we just did sort of a, a random sampling of 100,000 other knots with between 10 and, sorry, between 100 and 1,000 crossings. And those, more than 99% of them had Alexander polynomials with simple roots on the unit circle. So I think it's reasonable to view this, this hypothesis as um, uh, generic. It's a very weak hypothesis. Uh, this hypothesis is probably not generic. The thing we actually replace it with in the guts of the proof uh, might well be generic, but I, it's sort of hard to investigate experimentally. But certainly this applies to many, many examples. Uh, and the second theorem that I wanted to talk about before explaining to you the ideas machinery that describes the pretty pictures, you can look it up there, it's the following. So our second result uh, is suppose that our manifold M here, again, as denoted there, uh, is hyperbolic, so it's interior. as a complete hyperbolic metric of finite volume, um, then, as I'll describe more in a minute, there's a, a number field that's associated with a hyperbolic manifold called its trace field. Uh, and the hypotheses of this theorem are on that trace field. So if the trace field of M, so it's some number field, um, some finite extension of Q, has a real embedding, Then, again, we're going to get um, some kind of, going to show a bunch of Dane fillings are um, orderable. So in particular, 
Uh, the first conclusion is that um, there is an interval So it's not sort of symmetric about zero like the first one, but maybe it's of the form minus infinity up to A or possibly from A up to positive infinity uh, where uh, every uh, Dane filling is orderable. And a uh, second result concerns looking at branch covers, right? So if we look at the branch cover of this integral homology sphere branched over the not k, then it turns out you can also show that those guys are orderable. Um, so for a large uh, n, the uh, n-fold cover of this integral homology sphere y branched over k is order. So um, I guess those are our two, two of our results. Uh, are there any questions? Ah, so Dave asked, how restrictive is the, the trace field having a real embedding? Um, I think that's almost certainly generic. So uh, Matthias Gerner has computed the trace field for about 60,000 um, hyperbolic three-manifolds, everything that could be triangulated with at most nine ideal tetrahedra. And of those, 95% uh, of them had a uh, trace field with a real embedding. And, um, and I would only expect that number to go up. Um, so I, I didn't say really what the trace field was. So you have your whole nomi representation of this hyperbolic structure mapped from the fundamental group of M here into PSL2C. You look at all the traces of elements uh, in the image of that representation. Uh, because of local rigidity, it turns out that those Traces, those are all actually algebraic numbers. Um, and they generate a finite extension of Q uh, called the trace field. And uh, anyway, it's just some number field associated with a three manifold. And just to say it has a real embedding just means you can embed that abstract field in the real numbers. In other words, there's some polynomial associated uh, with this manifold that defines this trace field. And we're just saying, does that polynomial have a real root? So the more complicated a manifold, typically the more complicated this field is. And um, you would expect, or what happens in Gerner's data is like something like a third of all the roots are real. So Ian. Sorry, does it depend on? Um, yes, it does. Yeah, so this manifold, I just erased it, M here. I view as a knot in this integral homology three sphere y, but it's actually a knot in several different, well, infinitely many different integral homology spheres. Um, and so you can actually apply this theorem for a bunch of different branch covers, uh, and n would d vary depending on that. No, it's arbitrarily large. No, so there's no, the conclusions, I mean, are. In both cases, many Dane fillings um, are orderable, but the hypotheses are completely different. Although in the end, they'll be proved by the same technique. OK, so um, I want to now go ahead and try to explain, spend the rest of my time explaining where these pictures come from. Uh, and I should say that. I mean, I already said, I guess, that the technique's not new. And in particular, uh, especially for this result here, there are a number of antecedents of our work uh, due to, um, in particular, Tran, Hakamata, and Teragaito, Cameron Gordon, uh, proving results. In some sense, I think, well, I mean, at least in some cases, 
Um, not only do, are we generalizing their result, but we're generalizing the proof. Um, and also, I should mention the work of, of Cameron and Ty Lidman studying uh, what happens for these uh, branch covers. OK, so um, what's the technique? Uh, so one way to show a group is left orderable is if it's a subgroup of the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the line. Uh, and for countable groups, such as the three manifold fundamental groups we're talking about here, in fact, this is if and only if. Uh, and usually, I actually just view this as the definition of, of left order. What means you're a, you have a faithful action by orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the line. Um, and here's the technique that I'm going to use to produce, uh, to embed groups in, in homeo plus R. So I'm going to start with a very simple Lie group. Let's look at PSL2R, which, of course, I view as the orientation-preserving isometry group of the hyperbolic plane. Um, and I'm actually going to view this as a subgroup of homeomorphisms of the circle uh, via the action of the group G on the circle at infinity. So you can, of course, determine uh, the element of G purely by its, by its action on the boundary. Uh, and now I'm going to look at the uh, universal cover of the circle. Right, so we have our usual picture. So we have our circle. Here's its universal cover. Uh, let's put these guys at the integer points, 0, 1, 2, 3, minus 1. Call the covering map pi or something like this. Uh, and I want to consider um, the subgroup of homeomorphisms of the universal cover, which are lifts of these homeomorphisms G that are homeomorphisms of the circle. And so if I look at, so I'm going to define G tilde to be equal to um, lifts to the universal cover of homeomorphisms in SL2R. And so this is a nice subgroup. of orientation-preserving homeomorphisms of the line. And of course, a number of different ways you can describe or think about G tilde. Um, of course, it has an actual map to G, which is surjective. Um, the kernel is just the covering translations, right? The integer shifts. Um, so another way of thinking about G tilde is it's the universal central extension. Uh, the universal cyclic, infinite cyclic extension of, of G. Another way to say it is that, well, this Lie group G is not simply connected. It's homotopy equivalent to a circle. So you can take its universal cover, which is of necessity a Lie group, and that's G tilde. So in particular, the, the thing, I'm going to start considering like representations to G tilde, and the thing that's different from the representations that have come up in most of the other talks here is that uh, this is not, it's a Lie group to be sure, but it's not linear. Doesn't, you can't embed it uh, in SLNR for any n, such as life. So um, let me just give an example of, of using this. Yes. Oh, that's right. I erased the thing that I put to remind me not to write. Thank you, Cameron.
So just as an example, uh, application of the philosophy I'll be using, let me prove that the free group is left orderable, right? Well, we certainly know we can embed our free group into SL2R. We can think about it as a, a lattice in there if we like, if we embed it properly. Um, and then, well, our group is free, right? So there's no obstruction to lifting that to a map, the homomorphism embedding here to a homomorphism here. It will still be faithful, because this thing is. Um, and so now we've embedded this free group into G tilde, uh, which is a bunch of homeomorphisms. And so that tells us that this is left order. And this is the only technique I'm going to use uh, today, basically, to prove, to prove groups are left orderable. I'm going to find homomorphisms to G tilde. And to be able to do that in a systematic way to produce, to prove the theorems that I put up, um, I'm going to organize the set of all representations of the fundamental group of M, our manifold with torus boundary, into G tilde, into a picture that looks like, of which those are examples. Uh, but before I do that, I have to uh, just define, tell you a couple things about the group G tilde. So uh, the first is that uh, there's a translation number So this is a map uh, from G tilde to R. It's not a homomorphism. It's a quasi-morphism. Anyway, it doesn't, it's not so important. Um, it's defined as follows. So if I take an element of G tilde, you look at how far it translates stuff, let's say, to the right, um, on average, Specifically, it's going to be defined as some kind of limiting thing. So take g tilde to the nth power, apply this to some initial base point, x0. Uh, look how far you've moved in n steps. Divide that by n, so that's the average amount you moved. Um, and it turns out that this is independent. of the choice of an initial base point. So that assigns a number to every element in G tilde. Um, and to give you a feel of what these numbers look like, let me talk just for a second about the kind of elements you have in G tilde. So as you all know, the group SL2R, there are four kinds of elements. You can partition it up into the uh, identity element. Then there are the elliptic elements. These things uh, fix a point in H2 and rotate about it. Uh, there's the parabolic guys, which don't have any fixed points on the interior, but a unique fixed point on the boundary. Uh, and then the hyperbolic ones translate along, along some axis. So if we look at our map here from G tilde to G, call that P or something, we can take the pre-images of this partition here, and we'll think of G tilde as partitioned into uh, the central elements. So that corresponds to my Z over there, the pre-image of the elliptic elements, which I'll call elliptic. The pre-image of the parabolic ones and the hyperbolic. So the translation numbers, um, what does the translation number look on these different kind of elements? The parabolic and hyperbolic ones, uh, these things have fixed points when acting on the circle downstairs. And that turns out to force that if you look at the translation number of an element which is not elliptic, it turns out that this is always an integer. 
the translation numbers of the elliptic elements can be any real numbers. Uh, and it relates to the geometric formulation of, the, of an elliptic element um, by the following formula. So if you look at the translation number of some elliptic element in G tilde, then if, if I view this modulo 1, take the fractional part, uh, this is just the rotation angle of, take this elliptic, you push it down to G, it's just the rotation angle of the corresponding elliptic um, acting on H2 about its fixed point. Well, divided by 2 pi. So. 1 over 2 pi, rotation angle of, let's call this elliptic element G tilde, P of G tilde, about fixed point. So in particular, um, there's a subgroup, if you think about our standard picture here of hyperbolic space, if you look at rotations about the center here in the Poincaré disk model, then the preimage of this up in G tilde is a copy of, of the real numbers, um, which just corresponds to translating the universal cover here by, by any particular element in R. So there's this sort of this subgroup here, uh, which contains the center. But then if I, if I were to pick a different point, I would get a different copy of R. OK. So we have this translation number. So how am I going to try to use this to get a picture? What we're all here for, I presume. So if we have the, uh, we have some representation from the fundamental group of, of M. Remember, that's my manifold with torus boundary, the thing I'm Dan filling. Um, I want to consider uh, the map. Um, so I want to focus on what this representation looks like on the fundamental group of the boundary. Um, and in particular, I'm just going to record that via the translation number. So I'm going to consider the map where I take, uh, where here, let's say, yoda is the map from fundamental group of the boundary into the fundamental group of M. So we'll go from here to the fundamental group of M to G tilde and the translation number. So this is a map from pi 1 of boundary M to R. Um, and you know your basic facts about homogeneous quasimorphisms like this thing. You can see that because this group is abelian, this map is actually a homomorphism. It's not completely obvious, but it's true. Um, so in particular, I, it's a homomorphism from z squared to r, which I'm going to think of as an element of the first cohomology of the boundary. So I can feel this giving me something called, called the translation along the boundary of rho. This is an element of h upper 1 of the boundary of m with real coefficients. Um, so, I mean, just, if you don't believe my mumbling about why this is a homomorphism, I can just make this concrete for you. Right, we had our basis, mu uh, and lambda, for the homology of the boundary. That's how we defined our Dane filling. Um, you can look at the algebraic dual basis u star lambda star basis for the cohomology of the boundary. And then in these coordinates, the map 
what is the boundary translations of rho, uh, it's just you take rho, you apply it to mu, you take the translation number of that, that's some real number, and then you do the same thing for the longitude. So associated to each um, representation like this, we get a pair of real numbers. It's going to give us some kind of points, points in the plane, as you see in the picture. So in particular, then, now I think to find the basic object, that we use. Um, so let's first, I want to look at, this story kind of breaks up into pieces, so I'm going to focus on one piece. Right now, I want to look at all homomorphisms from uh, the fundamental group of M into G tilde, uh, where I mean, I'm looking at translation numbers here, and I said that the parabolic and hyperbolic guys always sort of have integer translation numbers. So I've got to kind of ignore those representations. Um, so where, let's say, rho of the fundamental group of the boundary uh, does not contain any hyperbolic elements. So we're just interested in representations once you restrict them to the boundary. They're either these elliptic elements, basically translation-like things, or parabolic elements. Uh, and then the, the main definition is what we call the translation extension locus. Um, and this is, uh, it's just the image of all of these representations under this map here, translation boundary M. So each representation, you look at how its boundary translates, um, and uh, then I'm going to take the closure of this, the sitting inside H1 of the boundary of M, the plane, uh, and let me call this, I guess I should give it some notation, let me call it EL of M. So it's images of representations, or the name extension, it's points for which it's the homomorphisms from the boundary, pi 1 of boundary M to R, which can be extended to representations to G tilde. Are there questions? All right, so now I think to, um, now I need to show the pictures, clearly. Um, so, and there's a basic, basic tool that we provide in our paper is a certain structure theorem um, about this extension locus. And I'll sort of put it up incrementally as I sort of talk through um, some, some pictures. So this is a picture of the translation extension locus for the exterior of the um, minus 237 pretzel knot. Okay, so this is a picture in the first cohomology of the boundary of M, uh, R2. And so this direction here, this is the mu star direction. Uh, and this direction here, this is the lambda star direction. So the first thing you notice is that my mu star axis only goes from 0 um, up to 1. And the reason I only drew that part is that one of the basic properties of this translation extension locus is it's periodic with respect to horizontal shifts. So So the extension locus of M, so, okay, so first I should have said, what is it in this picture? It's all the um, purple stuff. That's the translation extension locus, the purple stuff. So um, the first thing you notice is a bunch of arcs. Uh, 
So this is a locally finite union. of analytic arcs and isolated points um, is always invariant under some symmetries. So under a horizontal symmetry, so like uh, AB goes to A plus 1 B, horizontal translations by integer amounts. Um, and also, there's a second symmetry, uh, which in this picture manifests itself by being, if you rotate about this point here, it's the point one half uh, on the x axis, if you rotate about this by 180 degrees, it sends it to itself. Um, and that's uh, equivalent to saying that. If I drew the whole picture, which I, I didn't, that you have a rotational symmetry um, about, about this point. So there's this infinite dihedral group acting on the picture, um, which allows me then to only draw uh, this finite, finite vertical chunk. So you see, the vertical direction, you're not just going from 0 to 1 or something. In this case, we're going from minus 6 up to plus 6. Uh, but it turns out that. In fact, this thing can't extend arbitrarily far up or down. Um, so another property is that the height in either the positive um, or negative direction is bounded by twice the genus of this manifold, genus of a Seifert surface minus 1, the manifestation of the, the Milner-Wood inequality. Um, so once I mod out by the symmetry, uh, that effectively glues this side to this side, um, my translation extension locus is actually just a compact thing. Uh, it's a finite union of analytic arcs. Uh, now, there's some, some points here uh, on it which are marked, um, in particular along this axis. So uh, the two special kinds of points that I have to mention um, one of which is I took the closure of this thing. Um, and so the points that I add on by taking that closure are the ideal points. There are no ideal points in this picture or in any of the pictures I'll show you. Um, and there's also uh, this, the representations we're looking at, um, we excluded the ones where the boundary acts by hyperbolic elements. So we either have ones where the boundary is acting by elliptic elements or by parabolic elements. Um, and the parabolic elements, well, uh, those things, parabolics always have integer, uh, integer translation numbers. So these dots here are half dots. They're half dots, you see, because this side you should view as sort of being glued to this side. Um, so these, these half dots here, these correspond to things that come from representations to G tilde, where when you restrict to the boundary, um, you're getting parabolic, parabolic uh, uh, elements. Uh, whereas all these others, when the translation numbers between 0 and 1, these are always corresponding to guys where the boundary is acting by elliptic elements. Um, so there's also these special parabolic points and um, one thing we show is there are only finitely many of these. once you mod out by the translational symmetry. And, OK, so then, uh, let's see, what else do I need to explain in this picture? Oh, there's the difference between the black and the green dots. So in the second theorem, there was an hypothesis about you know, if the trace field had a real embedding. right? So if the trace field has a real embedding, um, then what that gives you is you can take the holonomy representation of the hyperbolic structure. So that's a representation which is where the boundary acts by parabolics. And then you can Galois conjugate the whole thing into SL2R. Um, and so you get uh, a representation into the group G from this real place. And what I should have said and neglected to is that um, 
in the situation we're in here of the exterior of a not an integral homology sphere, h upward 2 is 0. So the, I didn't say it. The, there's an obstruction to lifting a homomorphism into g to 1 in g tilde, um, which is just an Euler class that lives in h upper 2. Uh, it's the Euler class of the flat bundle um, associated to the circle action of g. So in our situation, if ever you have a real embedding of your trace field, you get some point in this diagram. Um, and the convention here is those points which are geometric in this weird Galois sense, those are the green points. So in this case, we have, uh, well, depends on how you count them. Essentially, up to, orbit, up to action of, of the symmetries. One, one of these is a Galois conjugate of the whole and only representation, and the others are just random, random guys. OK, so um, that's a picture. Are there questions? Yes? Um, uh, so in, in the examples that I'll show you today, you never, uh, never get up to this genus bound. Um, and one can actually, sh well, uh, yeah, and in particular, at least for the parabolic ones, like the fact that this, so that, I should say, this thing has genus five, okay? So conceivably, you could get up to nine, um, and we only get up here up to six. Uh, and you can sort of show that you can't have a parabolic point up here at height 9 uh, by using some ideas of Caligari. OK, so I, I think what I, last thing I need to do before showing you the rest of the pictures, highlight of the talk, um, is just to say how does this relate to uh, the theorems that I started with. So here's the key lemma of how we can use a picture like this to prove um, that uh, filling is orderable. So if we have, um, look at a Dane filling here corresponding to the rational number A over B, uh, if this is irreducible, and the following line, call this L of R, so this consists of all elements of H upper 1 which I think of as homomorphisms from uh, the homology of the boundary to R, so such that they kill the slope corresponding to this, A mu plus B lambda. Um, and so this is a line. It's the line of slope minus R. I apologize for that, but it's inevitable. Um, and this, it, if, if this is an irreducible manifold and this line meets the uh, extension locus at a point uh, which is a not ideal parabolic or the origin, then this Dane filling is orderable. Um, and the point is simply that the intersection between this line and the translation extension locus corresponds to some homomorphism to G tilde, some non-trivial homomorphism. Now, you should complain to me that maybe I don't know that it's faithful. And to be honest, it's probably not. But uh, work of um, Boyer, Rolfson, and Feast allows you to promote that non-trivial action to a faithful action. All right, so then in my picture like this, um, so I, I, maybe I should have also said this horizontal axis will be in all the pictures. This comes from the reducible, reducible representations. So if I take a line uh, which appears here to have sort of negative slope, something like this, um, then all of those guys, there's a whole family of lines here. So if I can take a line whose slope is sort of between um, 6 and minus infinity, it will meet the translation extension locus. And so with this thing about r corresponding to minus r, 
from this picture, um, you can see that you can use this lemma to order all the Dane fillings for r in the interval between minus 6 and infinity. Um, and this is a big chunk of what you expect from the conjecture, uh, which is that any um, Dane filling in the interval from minus 9 to infinity is a non-L space. And the one other feature that I, I wanted to mention here is these uh, blue points. Um, these correspond to the, um, as I said, this line here is the line corresponding from reducible representations, things that factor through the abelianization of the fundamental group M, factor through a map to Z. These correspond to roots of the Alexander polynomial that are on the unit circle. Um, so if you, if you can ever deform from a reducible representation off into um, irreducible representations, that can only happen at a root of the Alexander polynomial. And if the root of the Alexander polynomial is simple, you in fact know you can actually always do this. And so the, theor for the theorems, which of course I'm not going to give, um, they are simply that the hypotheses ensure that this diagram is sort of non-trivial that you have something coming out of a blue dot or if you have some kind of green dot, and then you just argue from the picture that that means a large number of lines must meet the translation extension locus, and then you, then you uh, profit. Supposed to advance things. Um, well, the significance of the lens space surgeries, uh, I mentioned them because Otherwise, this convention is opposite of what most people would think. Um, so just to end, just to show you a few, few more pictures, uh, this is a picture that's very similar to the first one, except much more complicated. I think there's something like 74 arcs, uh, these purple arcs, in my translation extension locus. This is the exterior of a twisted torus knot, uh, which also has a lens space filling. This pattern is very common. The thing you saw from minus 337, there's lots of, lots of the lens space surgery knots have this picture. Um, uh, and you can anyway, you can use this then to order all the Dane fillings in the interval from minus 75 up to infinity. Um, and you know that the set of non-L space slopes is minus 93 up to infinity. So again, you get a lot of them, but you certainly don't get all of them. I, here's an example which is just sort of a, uh, a little different in that you have a, an arc leaving a, an al a point corresponding to the root of the Alexander polynomial and then it's going back to a parabolic point um, on the boundary, except now the parabolic point's on the axis. Um, here's something without any reducible, interesting reducible representations. You just have an arc that goes from um, uh, a parabolic corresponding to a Galois conjugate of the whole nomi representation to some other random parabolic guy. Uh, here's an example which exhibits both of these phenomena. Here's a really complicated example. Um, this one's neat because it has some arcs uh, in the translation extension locus that cross the diagram from a parabolic on this side to a parabolic on that side. Uh, when you have this, it means that you can use the lemma to show that um, every Dane filling, every non-trivial Dane filling on this manifold has orderable fundamental group. Um, and if you apply results of Roberts, uh, you can see that, in fact, all those fillings also have taut foliations. So in particular, the conjecture holds for all um, Dane fillings on this particular, uh, some genus six fiber knot in the three sphere. Uh, here's another example. This is not a knot exterior in S3. It has some new phenomena. I'm out of time. Um, this has to do with when the, anyway, this is a pretty picture. I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention.